That's part of what makes us special as Americans. Unlike the old empires, we don't make these sacrifices for territory or for resources. We do it because it's right. Ah, uh, this bitch. Rome. In school, it's the empire we focused on the most, and one of the darlings of white male historians everywhere. Which, not saying this is always true, but is one of the ways I can tell if a white dude is racist or not. Like, if he's ridiculously fetishistically into Rome, there's a good chance he might be racist. In her book Antigone Rising, author Helen Morales points out that the West tends to think of itself as historically linked to that empire. A continuation of it which is what the concept of the West basically is. The term Western civilization is a catch-all to refer to the many cultures of European heritage that share common cultural ideas, philosophical foundations, and ancestral beliefs. Basically, the idea is that these cultures all have a common heritage which has been important in the development of each. Rome is a part of this cultural heritage, though funnily enough, those who carry on this legacy don't bear the title. Not of Rome itself, but of empire. And make no mistake, they are, to go fully mask off, we are an empire. America, I mean, obviously. Before last year that wasn't a talking point you'd hear often, it kind of went unsaid and for good reason. Empires aren't good, it's bad optics. The bad guy is always an empire, the empire is basically synonymous with evil. Especially within American culture, thanks Star Wars. We aren't an empire, we're united. The thing is, the quote I mentioned earlier isn't about America, it's about Rome, but you almost can't tell. It feels like it's about America. The man who spoke it was named Calgacus from a place called Caledonia, which is now modern day Scotland. Calgacus saw the effects of empire firsthand and warned of it, of Rome and her lies, and many of the Romans themselves likely wouldn't have had the same clarity as him. It can be easy to fall for this trap ourselves as Americans. Many American leftists don't accept themselves as being part of or benefiting from the existence of this empire, and we too often rely on media outlets and figures with a vested interest in the status quo to tell us about our history or what we're doing abroad. Remember that Biden told corporations during the election that nothing would fundamentally change. There's a reason for that, and we're falling for the trap, and we would be remiss to do so. So for this video, we're going to hopefully do the opposite. We're going to cover a lot of topics, and I'm going to be using a very good book that I read by author Harsha Walia. When I was in high school, my history teacher in ninth grade had us watch a documentary I don't really remember the name of, but the whole point was for us to learn about what was happening at the border. The documentary that we watched was propaganda. It portrayed the Border Patrol agents as like these kind-hearted and overworked men and women fighting the elements to provide people crossing with uh, water and supplies and shelter and stuff like that and, you know, doing their best to protect these people that are coming, fleeing nondescript violence somewhere across the border. We weren't taught what that violence was. It was just in our heads some unseen tragedy or war that in that collection of random places full of jungles and brown people who spoke Spanish and like drugs, that was our understanding of Mexico, or at least that was the understanding taught to us. The entire global south on our side of the planet and the US border was explained to us this way not very detailed. They never mentioned that the Border Patrol was founded by KKK members hunting former slaves escaping the horror of slavery to the safety of abolitionist Mexico, or that they regularly destroyed water left for people crossing the border in Texas, or that the Texas Rangers were an expeditionary force that exterminated indigenous people to make room for white settlers, 
or that the U.S. was the source of the violence people at the border were fleeing, or that many of those people at the border are descendants of indigenous people that those borders that exist now would be irrelevant for back then, that those people were being incarcerated for living on the lands their ancestors were born on, that the border was intentionally made a deadly journey and a tool of ethnic cleansing that has killed thousands and thousands of people since the 90s. They weren't taught about how black people who moved west to settle in towns like Tulsa were also ethnically cleansed. Hundreds of thousands of us forced to flee violence at the hands of white people. We didn't learn about the many, many, many times the U.S. either directly or indirectly committed ethnic cleansings. And as many as you think there are, there is more. Like, a shocking amount. Not just the ones here on American soil, but in South America, in Panama, in Mexico, in the Middle East, and in Africa. The blood on America's hands was shed from a multitude of peoples. It is the only real melting pot America has ever created. Growing up in the American school system was kind of a trip. Americans aren't necessarily taught the way that the empire truly functions. Hell, the word imperialism didn't even come up until high school and we didn't even fully explore it or similar talking points. It was presented to us in a way that implies the era was over. America was an empire, but we don't do that pesky imperialism stuff anymore. But funnily enough, whenever we're talking about this topic, as well as things like capitalism or communism, my high school history teachers, who were all black, gave me a vibe that looking back on it was something along the lines of, I can't tell you a lot of this shit or I'll lose my job, but please know this is bad. And one of them also had portraits of like Mao and Lenin on their wall. And when I asked about it, they kind of just gave me this look like, uh, you'll get it in a few years. But this was at the majority black and brown high school I went to. My all white middle school that I went to did not teach us any of this. And in fact, when we talked about manifest destiny in American history, it was painted as a good thing. Columbus was a badass and a hero and the Native American genocide didn't even happen except for like that one time and that one time and that one time and that one time and that one time, but then never again because we were all buddies. Remember the corn and, and the fish and the blankets? Wait, the point is when Americans learn about the history of the empire, they don't learn about the actual functions of it. Americans don't know how their empire was actually built, but like I said before, America is an empire, is, was, and will be. Which prompts the question, why? What is an empire and why does America fit into it? If you look up the Google definition of empire, you get a pretty basic and specific one. An extensive group of states or countries under a single supreme authority, formerly especially an emperor or empress. There's a slight flaw in that definition. It's kind of incomplete. An empire doesn't really have to be headed up by a single leader or an empire, in my personal opinion. It's less important who's in charge and more important what they're doing. An empire can be a triumvirate, an oligarchy, a corporatocracy, a tax haven for imperialist corporations masquerading as a functional democracy despite not having been functional for decades. Oh look, suddenly America. I'm sure there's no connection there whatsoever. The fact is, whether ruled by a queen, a prime minister, an emperor, or a president, an empire is an empire, and it takes the same techniques to build it up. But why care? I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people asking that right now. Who cares? I mean, I care because I don't like my country earning blood money. Many Americans will never even really see the benefits of empire since it exists to serve the ruling class and once you're low enough on the toten pole, you're basically a racialized servile class for the benefit of those who rule the empire, subjugated with much of the same violence outside of it, and a host of other reasons. The first part of Harsha Walia's book is about the borders of the empire, how it's maintained, and how it functions, and how these functions are rooted in the elimination of indigenous people, anti-blackness, and white supremacy and conquest. She writes, it is essential, however, that we ask how and why the border is made. U.S. bordering practices traverse many lands and maritime jurisdictions, and the U.S. border is externalized far beyond territorial limits. So let's do that. The first border laws as we understand them now were formed fairly loosely. It was mostly Texas Rangers, KKK, and slave-owning militiamen patrolling the border to prevent black freedmen and slaves from escaping into Mexico. In the case of the Rangers, they also specialized as an expeditionary force for the U.S. settler colonial project. Their job was to eliminate indigenous settlements and facilitate relations between racial groups that benefited white settlers exclusively. An easy example of this exact function would be the Port Vineyard Massacre of 1918, where Texas Rangers killed 15 Mexican men and boys, all unarmed. The Rangers did a lot of jobs like this, wiping out entire villages, while other militias obliterated indigenous food sources and annihilated the local ecology in doing so, the effects of which indigenous people alone would suffer. This militarized violence in defense of white wealth was the same song that spelled doom for black Tulsans just three years later because black people benefiting from capitalism endangered the empire. This process began in the 1820s, but it wouldn't be for several years until 1835 that the Rangers would be an officially designated thing. Officially, they were doing their jobs before the government stepped in and made it legal. Nothing really changed. It's the same thing with the police and the KKK. They were doing the same thing once they legally became the police. The only thing that changed was that it became more legal. 
This coincided with the U.S. imperialist war against Mexico. After that conflict ended with Texas being made a state and the U.S. taking control of what we now understand as the U.S., as well as the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. With the signing of the treaty, America's imperial project in the West and across our southern border would begin. The treaty forced Mexico to drop any claims to Texas and authorized the U.S. to capture land comprising all or part of present-day Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. In total, the U.S. seized more than 525,000 square miles of territory in Mexico, shifting the border south and rendering Mexicans living in what was now the U.S. a conquered people. An Anglo-American racial order of conquest was enforced. Mexicans in the captured territories were given the hollow option of U.S. citizenship while enduring systemic racial discrimination and segregation as alien citizens. Indigenous lands were seized in sovereign nations, including the Comanche, Apache, Siri, Coahuilteca, and Kiowa were forcibly assimilated into the U.S. nation state. Enslaved black people were subject to the Fugitive Slave Act, while all black people continued to be denied citizenship a pillar of white supremacy in the expanding slavery frontier. Indigenous assimilation has been a hot button issue lately with the discovery of the remains of children from a Canadian residential school. There are many indigenous people alive today, not much older than myself who remember what these schools were like and it's horrifying. These schools did not exist to educate indigenous people rather than as a form of cultural genocide and re-education to fit the cis heteropatriarchal capitalist project their genocide was being facilitated by. Those schools were a staple in the American West and stood alongside systemic efforts like the Dawes Act of 1887 and the Trail of Tears to break apart indigenous communities and their culture as they used militarized violence from established groups like the Texas Rangers to control the ever-expanding borders. According to some estimates, by 1900, there were over 20,000 children in these residential schools. The children in them faced abuse for speaking their native languages or displaying their culture, and the schools enforced an ideology of kill the Indian, save the man, as they violently forced these children to assimilate. Meanwhile, those outside of the schools faced a system slowly enveloping itself around them, with violence being systematized through establishments of border immigration laws, drawn along borders that, like in Africa during its own colonization period, cut off various ethnic groups of indigenous people from ancestral lands and other populations, with citizenship to the U.S. essentially forced on many people, and exclusion from citizenship forced on their neighbors, many indigenous people and Mexican people who had lived in the newly acquired territory and found it increasingly forming an existence for the benefit of white settlers felt alienated. They hadn't crossed the border, a border crossed them. Alongside this and the broad erasure of their culture, they'd also been racialized, meaning the U.S. systemically saw hundreds of thousands of diverse indigenous peoples and cultures as fairly homogenous, failing to recognize the cultural differences between indigenous groups, their traditions, beliefs, and methods of autonomy, which is again the same thing that happened in Africa during its own colonization period. The normalization of settler colonialism evades settler occupation as a method of imperialism and instead tries to produce indigenous people as domesticated citizens of the U.S. Theories of domestication and claims to indigenous lands, explains Dunbar Ortiz, obliterate the present and presence of indigenous nations struggling for their liberation from states of colonialism. The characterization of indigenous people as a domesticated U.S. racial and ethnic minority group not only omits the inherently anti-imperialist nature of indigenous struggles, but also homogenizes a multiplicity of indigenous nations into a pan-indigenous identity and undermines indigenous understandings of treaties as international diplomacy. It is important to have a good understanding of these things because the way the empire teaches about racism and indigenous struggles is incomplete. We are taught it was simply a spirit of hate. We are taught an idealist view of what happened. We are taught that it was simply a spirit of hate and that everything happening now to indigenous black and Asian people is now just a spirit of hate. It's just ambiguous hate. And I despise this because the legal structures that built our oppression aren't taught and are still in place in many ways today. And that is where the violence comes from. People and companies formed during these times are still profiting from them to this day, or only exist because of them. I want to make that fact more tangible here. Again, many of the US border policies directly impact indigenous people, declaring them illegal immigrants, destroying their land to make border walls, the subbar conditions of many reservations, the use of carceral solutions to deal with immigration. We aren't taught to see these as products of specific laws and policies still in place, nor to see ourselves from benefiting from them. And when I say us, I mean a soft us. Black and brown people were excluded systemically from the same benefits of indigenous elimination that would have made colonizing the West and fulfilling manifest destiny impossible. But white people absolutely benefited from this. Black people who managed to survive in these systems often alongside indigenous and Mexican people faced an encroaching Jim Crow, black codes, ethnic cleansings, lynching 
lynching is in slavery, all while acting as a servile class for upper class white settlers and making up much of the labor forces that would make the West habitable for white capitalism, alongside Chinese immigrants and other groups. The Western US and the maintenance of the border, therefore, are prime examples of the US empire's building tendency and lays the foundations in its methods for how the US would continue to build its empire and colonize. Across history, we see many of the same methods employed here to be shipped overseas and modified to fit the imperial capitalist need of the time and location. The dichotomy between domestic minorities and foreign subjects further unravels with the knowledge that the eliminationist Indian Wars laid the foundation for conquest abroad, becoming the template for genocidal warfare in Haiti, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines. Lele Kalili emphasizes, what was learned in the Indian Wars became the necessary if unwritten manual for subsequent overseas asymmetric warfare. Understanding these structures origins, however, is a slightly different tale because many of them are pulled directly from slavery and those methods of control and abuse. And this is where the story takes a familiar but slightly unexpected turn. One of the frustrating experiences of black people is a way we're kind of excluded from talks on issues of immigration policy. It's strange considering how much the system really does target black people, but immigration isn't really talked about often or spoken about often, at least in corporate media, as an issue for the black community to struggle against. Even though you'll find in activist circles that it absolutely is. There's an underlying cause for this though. Arrivants aren't kept track of demographically by race, only by their country of origin. The Black Alliance for Just Immigration describes this as both over-inclusive and under-inclusive because since the migrants from Africa and the Caribbean nations are assumed to be black, a lot of estimates include people from those regions who aren't black. And it's the other way around in places like South America where black migrants among those populations are overlooked. The surprising fact is black migrants and arrivants are less likely to be accepted and far more likely to be stopped by police and deported as a result. If you're a non-citizen and you get stopped by the police, there's a good chance you're basically going to get thrown into the deportation process on the spot. Considering black people are already disproportionately targeted by the criminal justice system, black migrants are in twice the trouble. The cornerstone laws of the US immigration system, the 1996 Illegal Immigration Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, IIRIRA, and the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, AEDPA, made three broad changes that ushered in the practice of mass detention and deportation that continues today. They vastly expanded the criminal backgrounds for deportation, often triggered by any interaction an individual may have with the criminal legal system, which frequently results in mandatory detention and deportation. The two acts are also one-strike laws, which subject non-citizens to mandatory deportation even in cases where no jail sentence is imposed. Other policies have worsened the perils faced by black immigrants. That includes the federal 287G programs, which enables law enforcement to transfer immigrants they detain to Immigration and Customs Enforcement ICE custody. The disproportionate policing of black people means that more black immigrants end up in ICE custody, and many are often scheduled for deportation over minor offenses, often without access to legal counsel and due process. Border and Rule goes even deeper into this issue, discussing how immigration policies found their base in Black Codes and Jim Crow. I've gone over the Black Codes before in previous videos, but basically post-slavery, they were a set of anti-Black controls placed on Black people that forced them to continue to act as an exploited labor class and maintain separation from white people post-slavery. Even though slavery was illegal, Black people were still needed for cheap, exploitative labor. If you didn't have a job, you got to go to jail for things like vagrancy, loitering, and other charges made up for this specific purpose. On top of serving local capitalists and plantations, brand new cheap prison labor. It was also a soft ethnic cleansing of free black people as KKK membership spiked and that group along with others began a campaign of lynchings that would kill 10,000 black people. Before this period, as mentioned before, border patrols conducted cross-border raids, hunting escaped black slaves, and also just kidnapped free black people. All of these events and the many more unmentioned served the purpose of keeping black populations available as a source of cheap labor for white capitalism, ensuring themselves a servile population while classifying free black people as an alien population within their own country, subject to a incarceration, kidnapping, lynchings, and expulsion. On top of this, they also harshly limited black development, ensuring white capitalists never had black competition and wiping out any that did exist, for example in Tulsa and many other towns like it. The criminalization of migration today is not analogous to, but has been inescapably structured through the legal trafficking of millions of Africans during the slave trade, the policing and regulation of blackness as a constitutive of white supremacy and racial capitalism, and the anti-black production of vagrancy and alienness within the nation state. Contemporary immigration enforcement and border control 
controls draw heavily from the foundational terror of anti-black violence, particularly with the regulation of black movement, as evidenced in the borrowing of both a structural logic of racial control and a punitive legal architecture. Similarly, the current protections of legal citizenship, on which many immigrants in the U.S. rely, such as birthright citizenship for their children, originate in black struggles to defend the constitutional principle of birthright, especially after the despicably racist Dred Scott Supreme Court decision in 1856, upholding the denial of U.S. citizenship to black people. Black movements forced the ratification of the 14th Amendment in 1868. I also haven't covered how Asian Americans were also subject to these same conditions. The Chinese Exclusion Act was another early immigration law that existed to control the movement of an ethnic group for the benefit of white settlers. For example, in our own sunny California, in LA, I stress these things because many non-black leftists think racism only exists because of capitalism when, as Ibram Kendi says in How to Be Anti-Racist, another book I've covered, racism and capitalism exist in conjunction with each other, not as a consequence of one or the other. The purpose of these anti-black controls was to foster a white capitalist system. Similar to how the Nazis, claimed to at least, sought socialism before a specific racial class, Americans sought capitalism for their specific racial class. These controls were so effective that the structures that made them, things like requiring black people to have papers proving they were free, the fight for birthright citizenship for black free people who weren't considered citizens inherently for a long time, slave patrols and border militias that kidnapped people, began to structure the immigration policy used for Mexicans and to take a similar shape and inform US policy on indigenous Americans. However, the war on migrants does not exist separate from or simply parallel to anti-indigenous and anti-black violence. Early US bordering practices were, in fact, conceived as a method of eliminating indigenous people and controlling black people, and US border imperialism is structurally bound up in these genocides. This shows tangibly why black and indigenous solidarity is extremely vital. The structures oppressing black people and indigenous people, as well as other populations, share the same structures and functions of creating a racial capitalist system. Identifying it as such is important because if we fail to understand the racial aspects of things as well as the capitalist ones, we fail to see the full picture and we cannot effectively fight our own oppression if we cannot diagnose them holistically. The fight against the police, against ICE, against the border patrols, indigenous genocide, and American imperialism are all connected, and there are newer players than those among their ranks. One many Americans here in the Imperial Corps weren't familiar with until a few weeks ago is the IDF. Before the British Mandate for Palestine, Jews made up approximately 6% of the total population. From 1947 to 1950, during the Nakba or Catastrophe, Zionist military forces expelled at least 750,000 Palestinians and captured 78% of historic Palestine. The remaining 22% was divided into the West Bank and Gaza Strip. During the 1967 war, Israeli forces occupied all of historic Palestine and expelled a further 300,000 Palestinians from their homes. Today, Israel continues to force Palestinians in Jerusalem and the West Bank from their homes and lands, which are often taken over by Jewish-Israeli settlers. The essential empire-building components are not unique to America, but this is the part where the importance I've emphasized in this video becomes truly relevant and apparent. The methods that the U.S. used against indigenous Americans and Mexicans based in anti-blackness, racism, and white supremacy are being replicated overseas to Palestinians and Israel, serving the exact same purposes they serve here, with the exact same rhetoric. What is happening in Palestine is colonization, pure, simple, and easy. Easy. It is not complicated, it is not confusing, it is colonization. Palestinians are indigenous to the lands they are criminalized for traversing, much like indigenous people characterized as illegal immigrants. Also similar to indigenous people who relied on staple foods like maize or bison or other foods depending on where you were, had their food sovereignty destroyed either by white American settlers intentionally obliterating the local ecology to wipe out food sources and speed along genocide, or trade deals like NAFTA in 1994 causing indigenous Mexicans to suffer food insecurity. Maize is sacred to indigenous communities. As all Gonzalez describes. Native seeds are a very important part of our culture. The pyramids may have been destroyed, but a handful of maize seed is a legacy we can leave our children and grandchildren. The decimation of thousands of varieties of native corn is a form of gendered genocidal violence, disproportionately impacting indigenous matriarchal structures and the livelihoods of indigenous women and harvesters. Olive trees carry more than an economic significance in the lives of Palestinians. 
they are not just like any other trees, they are symbolic of Palestinians' attachment to their land. Because the trees are drought resistant and grow under poor soil conditions, they represent Palestinian resistance and resilience. The fact that olive trees live and bear fruit for thousands of years is parallel to Palestinian history and continuity on the land. Palestinians are proud of their olive trees, they take care of them with care and appreciation. Palestine has some of the world's oldest olive trees, dating back 4,000 years. Some families have trees that have been passed down to them for generations, and the olive harvest season in October bears a socio-cultural meaning where families come together to harvest olive trees, bearing in mind that their forefathers and mothers tended to the same trees several years ago. In addition to their symbolic meaning, olives are a main source of income for around 80,000 Palestinian families. According to UN figures, around 48% of the agricultural land in the West Bank and Gaza is planted with olive trees. Olive trees account for 70% of fruit production in Palestine, and contribute around 14% to the Palestinian economy. 93% of the olive harvest is used for olive oil production, while the rest is used for olive soap, table olives, and pickles. Much of the olive production is for local consumption, with a small amount of olives being exported primarily to Jordan. With the growing interest in organic food and fair trade, Palestinian olives are also now reaching European and North American markets. Palestinians have had much of their food sovereignty taken from them in the form of IDF and settlers destroying those trees that provided families with food and economic stability for literally hundreds and thousands of years. Last year, over 8,400 trees were uprooted. 80% of Gaza relies on humanitarian food aid efforts to get by. And let's not forget who provides Israel with its weapons. It's riot munitions and armor, training both given and received from the US military and police forces like the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Hey, Google Los Angeles Sheriff's Department gangs. Do it. Open another tab and do it. Google LASD gangs. Do it right now. Check that shit out. Do it. A corrupt police force, led by a guy who looks like Donald Trump if he were a depressed jock who peaked in high school and used racism and neo-Nazi child-killing police gangs to make himself feel secure. Much like the many indigenous Americans and other indigenous people in Africa, Palestinians live under borders imposed on them by military force. Most Palestinians live in Gaza. This is a small area surrounded by Israeli-controlled land and sea and air. This is what I meant when I said Palestinians, like indigenous Americans, are criminalized for traversing the same borders their ancestors walked for generations. Palestinians are kept out of Jerusalem and other parts of Israel by walls, roadblocks, and over 700 checkpoints, many of which are technically illegal, and have to provide papers and permits to go into cities to work? Sounds really familiar, right? It should, because it's similar to how apartheid worked in South Africa, because the only reason they want certain ethnicities in their cities is to be their labor force. It's literally classic settler colonialism. Occupations of the West Bank and Gaza Strip in 1967 usurped more land with daily life in this warscape consisting of torture, assassinations, humiliation at checkpoints, curfews, sieges, incarceration, home demolitions, economic deprivation, and construction of settlements. Israel's colonization of Palestine has become interlaced with violence against African refugees and immigrants and Asian immigrant workers in Israel who are also characterized as demographic threats and infiltrators and subjected to labor exploitation, sterilization, and deportation. And while our Palestinian comrades face all of that, guess who's benefiting? People like this guy who you've probably seen before demanding the home of the family in the video saying if I don't steal it someone else will. In 2015, there were 60,000 Americans just like him settled in Israel, white American Jews. Do you see the pattern. Let's talk about Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny was an ideology and a sort of religious movement, not much but sort of, that took place among American settlers in the period after the Revolutionary War. A growing capitalist empire, the US needed to expand in order to function as an economy and needed an ideology to justify the things it would now have to do to achieve this. I'm gonna say this right now, Manifest Destiny is a fashy concept. It is incredibly proto-fascist and yet they taught it to us as something to be proud of. Hitler literally borrowed the concept for his own fascist movement when he he talked about things like Lebensraum. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but yeah. Manifest destiny, a phrase coined in 1845, is the idea that the United States is destined by God, its advocates believed, to expand its dominion and spread democracy and capitalism across the entire North American continent. Sounds familiar. Basically, Manifest Destiny is an ideology that believes America is an exceptionally woke and special nation that God likes a whole bunch, American exceptionalism, and makes it expansionist. It's literally the fire nation. We're so great we should share our greatness with the world. Greatness meaning commit genocide and imperialism to fuel our industry and technology and rely on fascism to keep it all ticking. The most important aspects are the religious and racial ones. Ideas of Christian purity and racial superiority are part of what gave this ideology a fervor that still exists to this day. 
At the heart of Manifest Destiny was the pervasive belief in American cultural and racial superiority. Native Americans had long been perceived as inferior, and efforts to civilize them had been widespread since the days of John Smith and Miles Standish. The Hispanics who ruled Texas and the lucrative ports of California were also seen as backward. In 1840, the entire southwestern corner of the United States was controlled by foreign powers, and the territorial dispute over the Oregon Territory had not been settled. By 1850, the U.S. controlled most lands from the Atlantic to the Pacific, covering almost all of today's continental U.S., expanding the boundaries of the United States was in many ways a cultural war as well. The desire of Southerners to find more land suitable for cotton cultivation would eventually spread slavery to these regions. There's elements of what would become lost cause ideology in there as well, which is also fashy, but you get the point. So why are we talking about Manifest Destiny? Let's talk about Zionism, and I can already sense that. My comment section and Twitter mentions are going to be very spicy. Subscribe to my Patreon so I can afford enough weed to avoid that pain. Zionism is not a one-to-one -one match to Manifest Destiny. There are some legitimate points within the ideology about providing Jewish people with a safe homeland and such that is very understandable considering the last several hundred years have not been very fun for Jewish people in a lot of places. But that's where my generosity to the ideology ends. Here's a definition. Zionism, a Jewish nationalist movement that has had its goal in the creation and support of a Jewish national state in Palestine, the ancient homeland of the Jews. Though Zionism originated in Eastern and Central Europe in the latter part of the 19th century, it is in many ways a continuation of the ancient attachment of the Jews and the Jewish religion to the historical region of Palestine, where one of the hills of ancient Jerusalem was called Zion. Despite having some distinction from manifest destiny and origin and structure, Zionism serves a similar purpose to other fascist and fascism adjacent ideologies like Manifest Destiny and Lost Causism. Manifest Destiny acted as an ideological explanation for colonizing the American continent, committing acts of genocide, expanding the state and its power, and furthering the development of a national capitalist, racial capitalist state and class. People use religious affiliations of the ideology to defend it and make it just, since if God is on your side, supposedly that means you can do literally anything to anyone, especially genocide. God God is pretty fond of those if you read the Bible, by the way. But that's also a digression. And that's gonna have to be a future video, let's be honest. Post-colonial theology, anyone? Like America claiming security, law, and order as an excuse to round up ethnic minorities they don't want while advancing white immigration, Zionism is used to explain and make okay acts of police brutality, war crimes, racism, fascism, and state expansion that all aid in the development of a very specific ethnic and racial class that just happens to include white dudes from Brooklyn and excludes just about everybody else. And that's literal, because while Zionists claim to include all Jews, in practice, black Jews in Israel face racism, forced sterilizations, and more. Israel is lying when they claim to be a safe place for all Jews. Many Zionist organizations in the US are often willing to portray Palestinian resistance and BBS campaigns, and not actual white supremacists, as anti-Semitic. Wendy Elisheva Somerson writes, while spreading anti-Semitic myths and allying with actual anti-Semites, the Israeli government keeps insisting that anti-Zionists are the ones forwarding anti-Semitism. To manage opposition to Israeli apartheid, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance has proposed a definition of anti-Semitism, conflating legitimate criticisms of Israel with anti-Semitism. This flawed definition has been adopted by the US, Canada, and EU countries at the urging of Netanyahu. At the same time, in order to secure economic deals to militarize Hungary's border, Netanyahu has dismissed the real anti-Semitism of Viktor Orban's praise for Hitler's ally Miklos Horthy. Never mind the literal pogroms and lynchings being done to Palestinians, and a reenactment of Kristallnacht against them a few weeks ago, where crowds of Israelis beat unarmed Palestinians in the streets, broke into homes, and did the stuff fascists have done throughout history while using cries of anti-Semitism to hide while excluding Jews who disagree with Zionism because not every Jewish person is a Zionist, and tying their Jewishness to that ideology is anti-Semitic. Or we can look at labor Zionism as Harsha Walia discussed, which is kind of like the work pass as we mentioned earlier, or at least it definitely includes that. A worker's utopia with joint ownership of production through Kibbutzim was a means of ensuring the, the primacy of Jewish workers. Labor Zionism enforced ethnic separatism in the labor force and militarized Zionist control over Palestine under the colonial slogan, Make the Desert Bloom. Wow, sounds familiar. Socialist Zionism thus entailed the total racialization of the class struggle and reconfiguration of labor along strictly demarcated ethnic lines. Wow! Sounds familiar! These methods of control are very similar as mentioned to South African apartheid systems, America's own segregation system, Jim Crow and the Black Codes, and literal Nazi shit. How Nazis literally treated Jewish people before and during the Holocaust. Beat for beat, it is the same story. In the case of Palestine, 
it is one of the best modern day looks at what colonization of indigenous Americans on this continent might have looked like. If you want to understand American foreign policy, just look at how it built itself here and you'll see it happening everywhere else America sets foot and sends its military. All cops are bastards, including the IDF. So we've gotten a look at our empire, more specifically how an empire builds itself, crawls from the self-made primordial stew of blood and labor stolen from people it colonized. But one of the things I didn't really talk about was how the empire pressures and controls other nations, otherwise not directly under their control. For example, the ways the US used the drug trade to help companies take control of the resources in global south nations, using things like the war on drugs to exclude and hide these actions while fostering the immigration is issues that it would punish families for getting swept up in. The international companies are robbing us. They take our lands, our forests, in our minds, describes indigenous feminist Reina Cruz Lopez. The cumulative impacts of NAFTA led to a crisis of displacement. Millions of indigenous people, farmers, peasants, and ejidatarios from rural areas were dispossessed and then proletarianized into low-wage factory and farm work. Employment in the maquiladora industry exploded by 86% within the first five years of NAFTA and exemplifying the growing feminization of precarious work worldwide. 85% of the workforce was women. Maquila border towns were also key sites in the drug war, fueling a crisis crisis of femicide in cities like Ciudad Juarez that continues to this day. By the year 2000, more than 1.6 million workers toiled in 4,000 maquiladoras, 90% of which were US owned, and set the de facto wage floor for manufacturing across the continent. 700,000 jobs, particularly unionized manufactured ones, were lost in the US, with black workers in Detroit hit especially hard. It would take me an entire video to do a topic on this kind of imperialism real justice though, but in the meantime I recommend you read this book in its entirety. Border and Rule is dense with a lot of information on the raw function of things that I find incredibly important. Specific laws, acts, dates, and consequences are all there. And on top of that, read Daddy Fanon's Wretched of the Earth for a lot of information on similar topics as well. I will definitely be doing so myself. Thanks for watching this. If you found this information useful, maybe put a tip in the tip jar on Ko-fi so I can afford to be constantly ordering books for these videos, among other necessities. Um, you can go to my Patreon for other cool content like the scripts to these videos, polls, poetry, and other things that I write and do. Thank you. Anansiao.